best in the world at engineering. Well, the British invented the steam engine, the internal combustion engine, the jet engine, steel ropes, steel ships, in fact, steel, come to think of it. Look closely and you'll find that the British were behind almost every big advance that shaped the modern world. In this series, I'm off in search of the best of British engineering. Some top coffins have steered me towards their favourite icons, which they feel best reflect our practical genius and form part of the story of how Britain came to lead the world in engineering. When it comes to buildings, it's a tough choice. Which ones do you think represent British engineering at its best? Our shortlist has some familiar faces and some real surprises. But it's no surprise that any best of British buildings top five would have to include a cathedral. Britain's medieval cathedrals are among the most awe-inspiring structures ever built. But they were Catholic, of course, and they look like other Catholic cathedrals in Europe. It wasn't until Britain shook off the papist yoke that we came up with a religious building for the capital which is so distinctively, unforgettably, British. In 1666, a small fire started behind a bakery in Pudding Lane. Within five days, the greatest city in the world lay in ashes. From those ashes, a great phoenix rose, St Paul's. If one building symbolises London, this is it. It was the Empire State Building of its age. St Paul's is the building the Nazis couldn't destroy. This is a Protestant British cathedral. But British Protestants were not above nicking ideas from Catholic foreigners. We pinch their ideas, then show them how to do it properly. Take the famous dome, which looks distinctly Roman. In fact, Protestant hardliners thought it was too much. It was too fancy, too extravagant, too Catholic. Unlike England's other cathedrals, St. Paul's is the creative vision of just one man, Sir Christopher Wren. Wren was a scientist, professor of astronomy at Oxford. He wasn't an architect and he wasn't interested in theological disputes about domes. He wanted to build a massive dome because it was a terrific engineering challenge. Wren wanted his cathedral to be dazzlingly light. But he didn't want all the windows to ruin his classical exterior. His solution was to hide them in a gully running alongside the roof of the nave. And he deployed other clever architectural tricks too. Here we see the pure genius of Wren. His plan was to fill this whole area with natural light. In the top of the outer dome is a small window, an oculus, which means little eye. Together with the hemispherical inner dome, this works like a microscope, flooding the whole cathedral with light. Wren and his thousand workmen created the largest Protestant cathedral in the world, towering over London at a height of 365 feet. St. Paul's has a message. Old Catholic Europe, it seems to say, was dark and gothic and oppressive, while modern Protestant Britain was light and classical and exciting. It took 33 years to build, cost nearly three quarters of a million pounds, and was financed by a special tax levied on coal coming into the port of London. This is called the geometric staircase. It's all a bit unnerving. These steps don't actually have any support. They just rest on top of one another. They only go into the wall about five inches. Ooh. When it came to the dome, Wren faced one huge engineering problem. 
domes were foreign. Wren didn't know how they were built, nor did anyone else in Britain. So he travelled in Europe to look at their best domes. He drew ideas from French, Italian, Byzantine and Islamic domes. Eventually he decided the best method was an inner dome supporting an outer dome. The support for the outer dome is provided by this conical brick structure built above the inner dome with rafters radiating from it. Its design still amazes engineers today. In fact, it was Wren's dome which inspired the leading architect, George Ferguson, to go into buildings. Massive structure, this dome. I mean, how does it work from an engineering point of view? I mean, how does it stay up? Well, it's held up by these eight coupled columns that go right, right yeah. down through the crypt mm -hmm. into the earth. And then you've got these arches, yeah, eight. these eight arches that go around, which he wanted to be equal. He felt that aesthetically it was very important, and I absolutely see what he meant, that this great circle was held up by a rhythm that was yeah. e eight equal arches. Um, and then he's got this great cone that goes through, and we can see actually the top of the cone, those lights at the top yeah. are coming into the cone. They hold up right. the, the uh, cupola above, 850 tons of it. This is thousands and thousands of tons of stuff. And then outside this is the timber and lead yeah, structure yeah, of the outer dome that stands way above it. And without that device, the St Paul's dome would not play the great place it plays. But the secret of how Wren's dome stays up is buried in the walls. Wren realized that his heavenly dome was going to weigh around 65,000 tons. That's a lot of heaven and thick columns weren't enough to support it because the weight of a dome pushes out as well as down. This solution was a massive metal chain hidden in the walls which acts as a belt around the base of the dome. The result looks effortless, an ethereal floating heaven from a distance and a dizzying drop from close up. Now this gallery has a strange quirk to it. It's called the Whispering Gallery. Apparently, if you whisper something over here at this side, it can be heard all the way over there on the other side. Let's try it. Sir Christopher Wren said to some men, if anyone calls, I'm designing St. Paul's. Isn't that amazing? I said, isn't that amazing? I said, isn't that amazing? I think it needs new batteries. Wren saw it through from the first designs in 1666 right up to the finishing touches in 1708. But there were murmurs it was all taking too long. Wren complained to Queen Anne that the decoration of the dome had been taken out of his hands and he hadn't been paid for 14 years. It's a sad end to the story of St Paul's and Wren, but he kept coming back here to sit under his dome and contemplate his masterpiece until he died at the age of 91. Wren considered the work his lasting memorial. As it says here in Latin, <coughs> Si monumentum requiris circumspice. If you seek his monument, look around you. traveling Britain in search of the best of British engineering and when it comes to buildings the glorious Cathedral of St Paul's breezes into the top five without working up a sweat after all its dome was one of the great engineering wonders of its time it looks as weightless as heaven itself but in fact it's a hulking great 65,000 tons so why doesn't it fall down To find out more about the engineering principles behind Wren's dome, I'm heading to our industrial revelations lab in Cambridge to visit our resident engineer Claire Barrett, a dozen eggs, a few bricks and a roll of sellotape. Well, the dome on St Paul's is actually just like half an egg mm -hmm. and an egg 
and a, and a dome, an incredibly strong shape. Yeah, we talked about arches. It's a 360 degree arch, isn't that's it? That's right, that's right. So, that's an, an egg with nothing, fa no fancy, it hasn't even been boiled. Right. Now, I don't know how much weight this is going to take. Okay. Uh, does it doesn't have to be a free range organic egg. <laughs> Well, I think for the chicken's sake, yes. All right, then. Yeah. Right, OK, this is good. It's not breaking, is it? It's uh, doing very well, actually. We're running out of it. That's going to have to be used. Oh, oh, there it goes. That's not bad. Four blocks of wood. Four blocks and a huge bit of concrete that you had up your sleeve, yeah. So how do you make a delicate egg-like dome strong enough to support 65,000 tonnes? Wren's solution was to bind the base of the dome with a massive chain buried in the walls. But how did it work? Because all the way to the dome mm -hmm. on St Paul's, it's pushing down, right. and then it's trying to push away around the centre line. And so Wren buried very cleverly this mm -hmm. chain right. around the bottom in, Portman, in the Portland stone, so and then covered it with cement. Yeah, so and draw thing. on that egg where the great chain that he buried would have gone. There. So that stops it yeah. spreading out. And as you draw a couple of eyes. There's an art class. I'm not going to bother putting the chain around the egg, but if I put a bit of sellotape around there. Right, okay. Okay, okay so sellotape is going to act like a chain and stop it pushing out. All right. And we'll see if we can put more weight on it. Right, so we have the great chain in place. We have the great chain in place. Now, I believe we got four of these on before, didn't we? Yeah. And it was the block of concrete that just I was just getting tipped away in with the that. balance. Yeah, well, let's care, put it on carefully. It's impressive. It's holding, that is incredible. Incredible. Oh, I think it's just unbalanced. Oh, you touched it! I did you not! Broke it. I didn't touch you it! Broke it. Break the tape, but I didn't touch it. If no short list of best British engineering is complete without God, the same goes for war. given us rockets, and jet engines, and steel ships. And in buildings, it's given us the castle, an Englishman's home, warrior race, and all that. And I've been steered towards one of the most loved castles in the land, Leeds, which confusingly is in Kent. I've only ever seen Leeds Castle on picture postcards before, and it looks just like it does on picture postcards. In fact, if you turn it around, there's writing on the back. This has been called the loveliest castle in the world, partly because it's since been converted to a stately home, but it's also damn clever. The Normans were the biggest kick-ass bully boys of the Middle Ages. They were also the best military engineers in the world. In fact, our royal engineers today trace their lineage back to the warrior engineers who built Leeds Castle. As you approach the castle, the first thing you hit is the Barbican which acts as a kind of heavily fortified porch. Now the Barbican is an amazing piece of Norman architecture. Basically, it defends the castle's weakest point, the entrance. It's a bit of a ruin now, but it leads to the gatehouse. Now the idea was to funnel the enemy together to make them more vulnerable to the castle's archers. In fact, you can still see some of the holes in the castle wall here. They'd poured boiling oil through there, right down onto the heads of the enemy. Imagine the mess that would make. Ruin your hair. Now, older Saxon forts were so-called Mott and Bailey. They dug a round ditch, shoved the earth in the middle, and built a wooden fort on the top. But at Leeds, we see the Mott or Moat taken to new heights of engineering. Leeds is built on a couple of small islands in a marsh, and around it was dug a large moat. But very cleverly, this great moat was fitted with sluice gates, so it could be drained and filled at speed by diverting the passing river Len. So, up comes an invading army, they set up camp around the castle, start polishing their swords and getting their ladders out of the van, and then, surprise, surprise, you open the sluice gates and, instant moat, you drown the lot of them. Or at least send them running home to get dry clothes. And don't forget, at this time, the walls surrounding the castle would have been twice as high as they are now, with hundreds of soldiers living in them. 
Even if an invader managed to escape a watery grave, it'd have to storm three drawbridges and portcullises and fight off a battalion of guards on the largest island before they could reach the royal family in their effectively impregnable inner sanctum known as the Gloriette. To find out more, I'm meeting up with historian Nick Fulcher. The Gloria, it looks so pretty rising out of the lake, doesn't it, Nick? Is that intentional? No, it's not actually. It's actually built for defence. Right. Very strong walls and surrounded by water. Edward I actually built this part of the castle for his wife, Eleanor of Castile. And the Gloria, I believe, means pavilion. No, it right? does. It derives from, a, from the Spanish term for pavilion, um, the intersection in a Moorish garden, which is um, Ellen of Castile's influence on the castle. But not somewhere she could sort of have her tea and watch the cricket? Not quite, no. <laughs> Fast forward to Henry VIII, who doesn't need a fortress so much as a country retreat. Now these days you wouldn't get planning permission to hack around a castle, but Henry was more carefree. He knocked down a few walls, shoved on an extension, and generally turned Leeds Castle into one of Britain's finest stately homes. This is the perfect Englishman's home. No wonder they chose Leeds to film the classic Ealing comedy, Kind Hearts and Coronets. And how did Henry VIII change the castle? Henry's not interested in a castle that can be easily defended. There's no particular threat in this part of the country. Um, so he changes it from a castle into a royal palace. He removes the outer walls, reduces them in height so that the views from the windows are so much better. Indeed, installs much larger windows to bring light into the castle. This is the charming fountain court, built in the 13th century. The fountain is actually built over a natural spring, and it involves an ingenious bit of 13th century engineering. Underneath these paving stones, there's a cistern tank which stores enough water to keep the pressure of the fountain constant. But not everything about this castle is as it seems. The fountainhead itself and this glorious Tudor facade are in fact 20th century. Lady Bailey, an Anglo-American oil heiress, bought Leeds in 1926 and spent 40 years restoring it. Today, the kings and queens are gone, and instead of soldiers brandishing swords, the castle is besieged by golfers waggling seven irons. But raising that sluice gate could still drown a lot of them. It's like a medieval water hazard. The British are very fond of tradition, and from castles to commons, you might think the style of our great buildings hasn't changed all that much over the years. But we're also engineering innovators who have transformed the science of construction. In the 18th century, Britain's industrial revolution changed the world forever. We became the first industrial nation, the workshop of the world. We invented new materials and new uses for materials with which we built new ships, new bridges and new buildings. So what radical building best reflects this engineering revolution? Get ready for a surprise. Eighteen forty-eight. Europe is convulsed by revolution. Marx publishes his Communist Manifesto and British engineers build one of the wonders of the Industrial Age. The palm house at Kew, made from iron and glass, was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. I used to come here a lot when I lived in London, uh, to Kew Gardens, and you'd always come to the palm house first. This is the first place you'd come straight away, you're sort of drawn to it. And it's a strange thing because, in a way, what's interesting about it surely has to be the palm trees in it, but the building itself is more interesting. So people actually come to see the palm house, not just the palms. The Palm House was revolutionary. It inspired Paxton to build Crystal Palace, Brunel to shove a glass and iron roof on Paddington Station. It sparked our national love affair with conservatories and started an engineering tradition that leads to Norman Foster's Gherkin. Nothing like this had been built before because it was impossible. The Palm House was created from materials which had only just been invented, wrought iron and laminated glass. The man with the window lean is the palm house manager, Wes Shaw. 
Well, it looks like good fun. We can have a go at that. But it's more fun in the summer, isn't it, than it is in the winter? Get well out your way. You don't trust me. Oh! It's high pressure stuff, isn't it? It's fantastic fun. It's been wonderful. <laughs> How long does it take to clean this it's, lot? You know, it's an ongoing project. We have to do this um, pretty much about four times a year. And this is just lo low level glass. It's like the first three mm. panes. Look at that. Beautiful. Loves the jobs you hate. But it's not just its use of new materials which makes the Palm House such an engineering achievement. They were put together in an ingenious way. The feeling of elegance in this building comes from the strange feeling that nothing is holding it up. So what's the secret of its strange design? Easy, it's an upside down ship. It looks like a ship and it's as big as a ship. A whopping 363 feet long, 100 feet wide and 66 feet high. In the spirit of our modern age, the workforce pieced together England's first glass building from a giant flat pack containing 10 miles of iron bars and 16,000 panes of glass. The Palm House at Kew made from iron and glass was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. That's a fun job cleaning the glass, isn't it? But hard work. It's a great job, but it's, uh, it's hard work that has to be done. These are all tropical plants that need lots of high radiation, lots of sunlight. But the elegant palm house had a serious industrial purpose. Britain's trading empire was opening up the world. In far off places, new exotic plants and trees were being discovered with new potential uses. But how could they survive in Britain's cold climate long enough to be studied? The challenge was to reproduce the tropics in suburban London. The secret is buried underground. I think you better go first. In case there's trouble. <laughs> Not a lot of people get to see this side of the I'm, house. I'm very flattered. It's all modern. It's, um, it's all high tech. It's 20th century. It's high tech stuff. We're, yeah. in a, we're in an old Victorian tunnel yeah. that stretches all the way past the Palm House Pond and over to Victoria Gate. And what was this for then? There used to be like a little railway system really? and uh, yeah. the old Victorian gardeners would push these truckloads of coal to the boilers that used to be situated in the Palm House basement. So the poor gardeners had to push carriage loads yeah. of coal as well. That's not it's a gardener's <laughs> brief, is it? <laughs> well, it was in those days. There's a saying in London that you're never more than 10 feet from a rat. You, you would think a tunnel like this would be full of rats because yeah. there's openings just up by the hedges and yeah. um, but no I've never never seen one all the times I've been down the tunnel. I yeah. say that when you work at the BBC as well. <laughs> okay well the tunnel takes us around to this chimney here. Rory. Ah yes. And this is where all the, uh, the smoke and the, the toxic yeah. fumes would be pumped up through here um, and out the top. This is a big chimney. It is yeah. Of course, from the outside, it doesn't look like a chimney. It just looks like an Italian bell tower. Well, that's what that is. That's just an sort of ornamental bit of disguise. Yeah, yeah. The coal used to feed 12 boilers, heating the water that was pumped through pipes running under the palm house floor. It's a testament to the engineers who built the palm house that it still functions today as well as it did 150 years ago. We only think about date palms and coconut palms, but there are lots and lots of different palms. There, aren't are, there? there are loads of palms. We've got about 3,000 different species of plants, palms throughout the world. Something like the coconut palm, for example, has got maybe a thousand different uses just That's for right, one yeah. plant. You so can eat coconuts, you can wear them. You can wear them, <laughs> yeah. You <laughs> can live in them. You can do anything. But actually, there's a great variety of trees because, I mean, apart from palms, I've seen chocolate here, uh, yeah. quinine. We've no. got a lot, yeah, that's right. We've got lots of economic plants. We've got everything from well, chewing gum. The chewing gum, yeah. Coffee. Bananas. Is there a beer tree? There's, yeah, there's one that does a nice pint of Foster's just over there. <laughs> and in the spirit of the Palm House, British engineers have now come up with another pioneering building for Kew, the award-winning Alpine House. And again, they've borrowed ideas from naval engineering, this time using sails. The greatness of Britain was first built not on manufacturing, but seafaring. Long before the Industrial Revolution, Britannia ruled the waves. We were the greatest maritime trading nation the world had ever known. You may not think of a shipyard as a building, 
but I'm told it is, and I'm visiting possibly the most famous in the world. Our next engineering marvel has dominated its city skyline for over 150 years. In Victorian times, the largest ships in the world were built here, towering over the city as evidence of great British engineering prowess. This gantry crane is called Samson. That one's called Goliath. That can mean only one thing. I'm at Harland and Wolf in Belfast. Harland and Wolf was built in 1861 and for more than a century was the biggest shipyard in the world. It was the most technically advanced yard of its time and it was gigantic, with capacity to build 17 large ships simultaneously. From opulent ocean liners to the latest warships, their decks bristling with guns. Needless to say, it was here they came to build the Titanic. Now, believe it or not, this huge piece of derelict land here was where the Titanic was. Well, that is the birthplace of the Titanic. In fact, you can just see two tiny bits of wedge-shaped concrete sticking out. That's part of its slipway. And the superstructure was put in over here in the Thompson Dock. The biggest ship in the world built in the biggest shipyard with the biggest cranes. Big, big, biggity, big. So what if it sank? But actually, building the Harland & Wolf shipyard was a monumental engineering challenge in itself. They couldn't just flatten a large section of Belfast, though later generations had tried their damnedest. Instead, like Atlantis in reverse, the yard rose from beneath the waves on land reclaimed from the Lagan estuary. Telling me how is the yard's former chief naval architect, David Livingstone. The amount of earth that was shifted to construct this shipyard uh, was absolutely amazing. And of course, it was. A lot of that was done with horse and cart, wheelbarrows, manual labour. There were scores and scores and scores of navvies. Uh, must have been back-breaking work. I think it ranks with many of the, the great engineering feats. In the yard's heyday, up to 35,000 men welded, riveted and laboured in the yards. And a ship a week was being launched from the slipways. Even today, this is still the biggest dry dock in Europe. Today, in one of the smaller dry docks, repairs are being carried out on the Caledonian car ferry. I have to say, this is the first time I've been under a ship. I mean, voluntarily. <laughs> and knowingly, in fact. And I have to say, it's a, it's, um, a big ship. The Caledonian was built here in the 70s and has come home for some running repairs. Time for me to add a tiny white line without which it'll probably sink. This is my Roll Ferris moment, yeah. yeah? Now what am I doing here? What's the purpose That's of this? That's a draft mark. That tells the level of the water. Look at that, eh? Perfect. Good job. Okay. Any vacancies? Now at the end of the dock here, we've got that big thick wall that holds back the sea, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah so. exactly. You trust that, don't you? Well, you have to. <laughs> it's quite a scary thought, though. I mean, you're used to it, you worked here for years, but I mean, it's quite scary. There's tons of water out there. Yeah. yeah. There's something slightly unnerving about standing under a big ship which is held up with old copies of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and I don't like the look of that recently fixed gate. So I climb to safety on top of one of the famous Harland & Wolf cranes. Silly idea. Horrible view down there between the two sides of the crane. Horrible. Oh, and uh, I want to go home now. But instead of letting me go home, they're sending me down a weird metal arm thing to a funny glass cockpit dangling in a frightening sort of way in mid-air. The things I do for money. Sorry, did I step on your head then, Billy? No. Okay. <laughs> That's a nice place you've got here. Yeah. So how high are we up here? You're roughly about 280, 300 feet. The way you were fighting design was coming up here the first time. Probably not, I've seen your face, no, but... Um, <laughs> so you've got to have the best view of Belfast yeah. available, don't you? Yeah. In fact, you are actually higher than planes landing. That's a bit, that's a bit weird if you're looking down on them, coming in the land, you know. <laughs> the wave? Yeah. yeah. So what sort of bits of gear do you shift around in with this, then? It would be large ship sections. Yeah. And how big are those? 
the plates good as it could be any size yeah. basically right. if it, um, it, it could be the size of a house the size of a yeah. building you know the size of a small factory yeah. you know let's say anything up to 840 tons mm. primitive cranes have been around since ancient times and used to build the likes of leeds castle but it was the british who pioneered the modern industrial crane having invented steel rope so to see how the thing works, which I confess I've never really understood, I'm off to see Claire, and I hear she loves picking up strange men. I've been thinking about all these buildings, Yeah. and the bit we don't see anymore is the scaffolding That's and the true. cranes. How they lifted those heavy loads. I'm going to put a part of my body <laughs> in this hole, okay. and are you going to pull me out? Well, yeah, so if you're a massive bit of stonework for Leeds Castle, Ooh. Then I'll pretend. You pretend. Then it would actually be incredibly hard work. Jumped up the rope. It's not going to work. <laughs> well, I'm happy if with you. You try it the other way around. You try and with me. I bet it's not going to work. <laughs> I'm not making You're any. not doing anything. Well, we're not going very far, are we? You think there's another <sighs> 45,000 tonnes to get up to the top of Leeds <laughs> Castle? You're going to have okay. to think of a better way. What is a better way? Block and tackle. Block and tackle. But which is the block and which is the tackle? Tackles the rope. If we keep looping the rope backwards and forwards and backwards and yeah. forwards, we make it a lot easier. We need, we need much less effort. Why is that? Because the eight pulleys magnify the force eight times. And using this block and tackle, it will be eight times easier than it would be just once. OK. So you're suggesting that if I get in that, you'll be able to move me on your own with that tiny bit of string. <laughs> Oh, there you are, what could be easier? Keep going. No, it's alright for you, we're just hanging around. <laughs> That's what I do well. So I've got to move it eight times as far, but it's eight times easier. Mm. But it's still quite hard work, isn't it? It was for me. <laughs> so when you look at a Harland and Wolf building, I mean obviously they're not using blocks and tackle there. They are onto tower cranes, aren't they? Tower cranes. But all a tower crane is, basically a block and tackle on the end of a long arm. Mm. So on Holland and Wolf, you'd be able to swing it across the whole building site without having to have lots and lots of scaffolding. So you're going to take me up in this, are you? Oh. Go on, go and put your harness on. All right, so this is just like a jacket. <laughs> 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 Could you just stop me uh, doing it? Hey, look. Ready? <laughs> no, is the answer. I'm not ready. <laughs> Off you go. Yes, indeed. You see, Roy, this makes my life so much easier having an Does electric it really? But people will ask that it's because it's an electric motor. Is it the same? It's exactly the same. So actually, the electric motor doesn't have to do as much work as it would if it was just a, a rope slung over a hook. There you go. Just like Harland and Wolf. Mm, yeah, this is actually more scary than Harland and Wolf, I think. <laughs> so are you going to join me up here? Can I? No, I, th I was going to go and have a cup of tea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Claire was only joking, of course, and two hours later I was back on the ground. And now that the circulation has returned to my groin, I'm off in search of our next engineering icon. An icon fit for the 21st century, but which remains, in its way, distinctively British. Now, it seems unlikely as I drive through this beautiful Surrey woodland, but I'm about to enter the most testosterone fueled environment in the world. Formula One racing. To build cars you need a factory, and we all know what factories look like. Frightening, smoky, dark, satanic places, usually in the Midlands. Well, think again. The British invented factories back in the 18th century, and we've built some pretty impressive ones since Arkwright started doing his stuff. But this one must rank as one of the most beautiful factories ever built. This is the McLaren Technology Centre. As you can see, it's a spectacular building. I don't think we're doing it justice today because it's a really murky, overcast day. It's just started to rain. It probably looks a bit bleak here. A bit alien to me, a bit sort of space age, but alien. Though I am assured there is a human heart in there beating away. It's a bit Thunderbirds-like, actually. You almost expect Thunderbird 2 to come out of the lake, though they actually don't do anything as useful as International Rescue here. They don't save the world from rogue psychopaths in little states in South America. They just make racing cars. But interesting enough, this was ranked fourth by the general public. Fourth favourite building by the public who've never seen it. Isn't that amazing? They've never seen it because they can't. This factory has been deliberately hidden from view. Why? 
Because these days when you tell a local council that you want to build a dark satanic mill on the third field from the left, they get a bit uppity. They like the idea of the jobs, but they don't want you to spoil the view, such as it is. So McLaren were told they could have their factory so long as no one could see it over the hedges. The result is one of the most graceful, flat, modern buildings in Britain. It's just a shame none of the locals can see it. The man responsible is Ron Dennis, McLaren's chief executive. You get this quite this surreal situation where you emerge oh, wow. and you're absolutely faced by this tremendous view. We've run many, many awards for the building and, uh, and probably the first award which actually put a smile on our face was when the French awarded it as the, uh, gave it the uh, automotive architectural statement of the year. And of course the France that gave us Renault, whom you'll have heard of. Oh yes, <laughs> vaguely. <laughs> Now, Ron, can I ask you, are you attracting sort of creative people in here be just because of the building and the space? Well, well I think so. I mean, uh, I say to them, you know, we're going to make this place so great you don't want to go home. Now what is truly amazing about this building is it's not just office space. Formula One cars are actually designed and built here. Isn't that right, Chris? That's right. Yeah. Will this be ready by Tuesday? Once Chris has built my car of the future, I imagine he'll bring it here to the wind tunnel to check that it's as aerodynamic as I am. Now I'm not going to tell you how long this is or how much the steel weighs because I can't remember. But this, the wind tunnel, is the most important tool in Formula One engineering. We can't actually film inside it because McLaren are very sensitive about their racing secrets. But I've seen them, so if you want to know, just give us a call after the show. Like my lovely assistant Claire, this building isn't just pretty, it's clever. The wind tunnel needs 6,000 litres of cold water every minute to cool the thing down, and the builders have found an elegant, economical way to do it. They use the water from this lake to cool down the turbines that drive the wind tunnel. The water goes into the system and is used in the air conditioning as well. And then it comes back into the system quite hot at the top of this cascade. Now the water is recooled by trickling down that cascade and it goes back into the lake warm. Actually there are carp in this lake and carp can withstand quite big variations in temperature. Obviously if the water goes in too hot, <laughs> the carp explode. Even Ron Dennis couldn't build a place like this on his own, so being Ron, he brought in some of the best architects in the world, the British firm of Foster and Partners. David Nelson was the partner in charge. It's probably a compliment to you and Foster's and, and Ron that you forget it's a manufacturing centre, don't you? I mean, yeah. I, this is a car factory. It's a car factory. And, and this is like no car factory you could yeah. ever imagine, isn't it? Well, Ron had a very clear idea of, of what the, the ambitions for the building should be. Mm. He really spent a huge amount of time thinking about the project. Mm. And uh, that's, that's rare. Yeah. It sounds an unusual thing to say, but it's a very unusual thing to no, say. No, well, I'm so with, I said, now we're here to talk about the building, but we're talking about Ron instead. But in fact, in many ways, he was, he was mm. very hands-on, wasn't he, right from the beginning? Very yeah. I think we um, we stopped counting after our 200th meeting, it became a bit academic, and we used to meet every two weeks, and uh, they're about five, six, seven hours long each time. British architecture has a different character to French, say, or Italian. We don't mind our buildings looking pretty, but we like them to work. For all the fancy architects, the McLaren factory remains essentially an engineer's building. As with, say, the Lloyds building in London, much of the industrial inner workings of this factory are proudly out on display, much to the delight of Ron. If you look up above your head here, you can just see the efforts that we went to to actually make sure that all the mechanical and engineering services actually formed a bit of an architectural statement in themselves. Ron wanted engineering as art, and this factory does it. We tried to impress on everybody that was involved that there was a strong desire for attention to detail. And uh, that sort of ended up in companies such as uh, the supplier of this autoclave actually caring about the alignment. And you can see all the alignment and the neatness of how that's that is, done. Yeah. You know, that, that's a good looking that, machine. Isn't yeah, it? not only that, but it's also, you know, it makes you proud to be English. And yeah. there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of the people that are very quick to knock England as not having you know, uh, an either an attention to detail or, more importantly, seeking perfection. 
It's easy to get confused these days. Our art galleries look like old factories, and our new factories look like art galleries. But it's also a sad sign of the times that instead of showing off our building achievements, planners want to hide buildings like this from view, because this is one truly fantastic piece of industrial architecture. People come here and the best expression that I really like to hear is, we actually get it now. You know, some people thought I was complete barking mad to embark on this project. Some of, some of my colleagues thought I was barking mad, you know, because it was a phenomenal investment. Just how big an investment has never been revealed, but it's rumoured you could buy 1,000 of his £300,000 Mercedes McLaren SLRs for the same price. Engineering experts have picked five buildings which they believe represent British engineering at its historic best. But which do you think is the best of the best? Leeds Castle, the picture book castle comes stately home to beat them all. St Paul's Cathedral, whose glorious dome is one of the most recognisable of all British landmarks. The Palm House at Kew, the world's first iron and glass building, an elegant monument to the industrial age. Or Harlan the Wolf, the giant yard that built the Titanic. Or McLaren's new super duper space age racing car factory. Q, Q, that's my favourite. Q, Q, Barney McGrew, yeah. yeah. Um, it's pretty. Elegant. Uh, it's glass and iron, isn't it? Sophisticated. Sophisticated. It's very impressive. And it does exactly what it should do. It's an amazing space yeah. for keeping the plants. So, what's your favourite then? Well, you have to say, Leeds Castle, the technology was very primitive, wasn't it, yeah. to build it? So you have to say, that is a hell of an achievement. Wren's Dome, we've looked at the eggs, you know. Yeah. That was a great, that that's a, a great very bold, bold, bold gesture. So the McLaren um, Centre benefits from science, doesn't it? Yeah. A science that wasn't available to the, the other buildings. Harlem and Wolf Dry Dock, not really a building, is it? Well, it is a building. It's a construction, isn't it? Yeah. And in many ways, uh, engineers, builders watching this thing, as difficult and complicated to construct as anything. I don't know, I think it's going to be St Paul's, you know. I think there's something about... I know, I think it's so not just... you have St Paul's and I'll take Q. You have Q, I'll have St Paul's. Well, we've chosen. I've gone for St Paul's as my favourite building. Well, it's Claire. actually Q is definitely the best. As Claire, and she's entitled to her opinion, even though it's wrong. And what about the next generation of British building icons? Well, there's the Battle of the Titans coming up. Norman Foster's Gherkin versus Richard Rogers' Cheese Grater. Sounds like a bust up in the supermarket. Or will it be Wembley Stadium sporting the biggest roof span in the world? But we hope you've enjoyed all the buildings we've looked at and we hope you've learned something about the engineering that goes into building. From Claire and myself and all the buildings, goodbye. <laughs>